resolve it in context of general, recording is on uh, linux and ubuntu so um, le uh, let's then get started i'll just uh, share my screen and start with the uh, the session So first, let's uh, go to eventier.com. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes, yes, Ari. Great. So first of all, let, let me log out. Uh, sorry, everyone. I I realize I shouldn't have logged out. We are logged in into the event a platform itself uh, for the session. So uh, once you go to eventa.com, you see the screen where we can see some featured events. So as you all know, events general general terminology an event uh, can happen over a span of days, and uh, thus there are two sections here: featured events and upcoming events. And then there are call for speakers. So call for speaker events mean that the events which are upcoming and they have uh, open call for events, which means that speakers can submit their sessions, and uh, you know uh, the moderators and organizers of the event will accept or reject the sessions of the speaker. So these are the three sections on the front page. And then if we go to a particular events page, we call it a public page. So if you uh, hear uh, or read in uh, an issue that uh, this is a public page of the event, then it means that it is, uh, you know, uh, the front facing uh, the uh, the page which uh, the entire public accesses. So this is the public page of the event, and it has various sections. For example, the event description, ticket section where the present tickets are, uh, you know, uh, shown. With the you can select quantity and there are multiple prices. Then there are featured speakers. The speaker is someone who has a session in an event, like me and others uh, in Forsythia Summit. And then we have uh, sponsors, the, the partners and sponsors. As you can see, there are multiple levels of sponsors. And then uh, the organizer information and address. And similarly, there are sections like um, take a schedule where you can go and see uh, the various sessions you can sort by popularity and by time and by title. You can select a particular day and uh, you can favorite a session. For example, I favorite some sessions here so I can add a session to my schedule. And, uh, uh, you know, and the circle and the text you see in here means that this these amount of people have uh, added the session to their schedule. And thus, I can click on my schedule and also filter that show me only the sessions I've, I've added on my schedule. And if you go to a particular session's detail page, you can see the expanded list and all the attendees who have uh, you know added it to their schedule. And uh, if a person's uh, schedule is public, uh, they have, if they have enabled the public profile, you can click on the person's uh, avatar and see all the sessions that they have uh, favorited. For example, I'm seeing here Mario's uh, sessions. And thus, uh, this information can be interacted that what kind of sessions a person is interested in. Similarly, there's an Add to Calendar section here. If I click on it, then uh, you can add event, add sessions, and add my schedule. So uh, generally, uh, this is something that you will see. There's an uh, exhibition section and uh, other stuff. So this is the public page. And then uh, th uh, there's a, an organizer section. So for example, if I go to manage events, uh, I can see here the events that I am I have created or I'm an organizer of. So this is <coughs> the manage event section. And if I go to the event dashboard, I can see the organizer section of my event. And this is generally some somewhat confusing to users when they start if they hear about uh, the, the bug is in organizer section and sometimes for example if i go 
and paste this link on the issue to to show that hey, the uh, the error is in organizer section and uh, ticket section or something else right so uh, they try to access the url and they get an error that you do not have access to this uh, page and they say that i cannot access this page uh, well yes you cannot access this page because this is my event so generally if you try to solve an event uh, sorry so if you try to solve a bug which involves an organizer uh, section then it means that you have to create your own uh, you know event to access the organizer section and then uh, but it's still, is there something that you can do on eventy.com? You can create your own event. So uh, if you go to this create event section, there's this event wizard, which you can use to create your own event. And thus then can access the organizer section. And then the last section I'm going to talk about here in the introduction is the admin section. And this admin section uh, is something that you cannot access on eventy only eventy admins can access this information and thus if you want to debug and solve an issue on the admin section if there's something written that uh, something is not working in the admin section then you have to deploy the server locally and thus make yourself the admin there and then you have to solve the issue so uh, in just i wanted to clear these three sections out uh, that public section, obviously a public event, you can access it. It's the easiest bug to reproduce and solve. Well, not solve, but it is the easiest to reproduce. And then there's organizer section. If you want to solve a bug there, you need to create your own event. You can do it on eventia.com or the development site, the development server. Uh, the next uh, part, uh, the last section is the event, uh, ad, sorry, admin section. And for solving issues there, you need to deploy the um, you know the server locally and then uh, link it to the front end to solve it so uh, i hope the sections are clear i'm not going too much into detail as this is a workshop and we'll get hands on so uh, then i'll get started with the uh, the uh, workshop so i hope everyone is on linux so uh, is everyone on linux or does anyone have a windows machine uh, here so uh, the, prerequisite, the prerequisite is Linux. So uh, I hope everyone has Linux. Uh, does anyone have Windows? So guys, this is uh, uh, an interactive session. I'm currently uh, you know, sharing my screen, so I can't see the chat. So if someone has to speak up, uh, uh, please uh, you know, use the mic. But if uh, you know, don't say anything, I assume that the answer is affirmative to my um, yes, Pradeek, there are some Windows users uh, in our chat. Okay, so uh, for the Windows users, I'll recommend that you use uh, WSL too. So WSL is Windows Substrate for Linux, subsystem for Linux, and it enables you to run Linux on Windows machine. It, it runs in a virtual environment, but it's much faster than a normal VM. And uh, you can install WSL too. Uh, you can make this work on Windows, but we don't support it. And if some issue comes up, it will be very hard for us to solve it. So that's why I recommend you to use Linux. Uh, but uh, anyway, if you have Windows, you can just see what I'm doing. And when you try it out here on your own, you can just repeat the steps. So uh, I'm in my terminal. I am increasing the font size a little bit more. I hope uh, you can see it, right? So as you can see, I don't have uh, uh, anything in my repository uh, current directory and then i will be going to the uh, the first step of uh, contributing to any project is going to the repository so i'm i've opened this repository open event server so uh, i am i'm increasing the font size again so this is the open event server repository and it has the uh, readme so first if you want to install it you have to read the uh, readme file and then there's some information about the master development branch deployments so we'll be following the local installation guide so once i open local installation guide uh, it lists some steps so i'll be following that it says i need python 3.8 i need postgres and open ssl so uh, these are the uh, requirements of the server most of the times the beginner uh, gets stuck on the version of the dependencies so for example they have Python 3.6 installed and they get an error. 
or they have a higher version of Python and they get an error as well. But we only support Python 3.8. Now we are using a poetry dependency so uh, manager. So it actually is very strict about Python versions. So it becomes even more uh, you know, important to for you to install the right Python version. So we'll see how to do that. But first, uh, we need to uh, you know, clone the repository. So first, let's go ahead and clone the repository. And uh, this is a very fresh instance of uh, Ubuntu I have here. I've created a Docker environment so that any error that you get on first time installing the pro you know, project, I get it as well. So let's say I clone it to uh, clone into it. So one thing which is pre-installed in this project uh, in this Git uh, the, the Docker environment is Git. So if you have not uh, installed Git yet, I'll just show you once this is cloned that how to install it. It's it's plenty easy. I'll be assuming that the Linux uh, uh, the Linux uh, distro you're using is Ubuntu, and obviously any derivative of it like elementary and uh, Linux Mint works, but uh, I'll, the commands I'll be using for dependency management is of uh, Ubuntu and the official uh, you know, documentation also only supports Ubuntu. It also supports Mac, but it's somehow outdated always. So anyway, let's say if you don't, do not have Git installed, you first run sudo apt update, right? So what, it, what does it do is that it updates the uh you know information the registries of uh, the software available and then you install a git by writing sudo app install git so this is not just uh, about git this is about uh, any software if you want to install it you first of all try sudo app install and the software's name otherwise you just search on google and you normally found find that what what needs to be done but anyway i have already installed git uh, so uh, it does not install it for me again then i go back to the documentation and then next thing is i want to cd mm -hmm. into the project one the thing Arip, yeah. is it better if, it, uh, if we fork it and then clone it yeah yeah so uh, definitely uh, the documentation would have mentioned that if you want to contribute first fork the original repository to, to your grid, uh, GitHub profile. I'm not going to do it here because I've already forked and it might be you know, a few commits behind. So I'm just using the Fossetia, uh, you know, uh, the original, the origin of the uh, open event server. But uh, if you want to contribute, you definitely have to uh, fork the project and then, uh, you know, clone it. And this is also an important point. Thank you, Pratik, that. Uh, whatever we are doing, uh, well, uh, you know, you can follow it step by step and still get to the working version of the server. But obviously, because it's a workshop and I want uh, you to try try it hands on and later, uh, you know, answer your questions, I'm going to be skipping some of the steps. But you need to read documentation carefully and, uh, you know, customize it to your needs. So then moving on to the next step. Uh, as you can see, there's a lot of details into the uh, documentation about SSH keys and everything. Uh, I'm going to just go ahead and uh, then talk about installing the system dependencies. So for macOS, this is the uh, things which we have to install for Debian and Ubuntu. This is the command. So I'm just going to copy it and paste it. I'm currently in Open Event Server. So this is also something which people do. They try to run some command and it doesn't work. And I realized that they are not in the project repository. So once the person, uh, the, once the documentation has said that you need to cd into the project, <laughs> some commands may work without uh, being in the project. But you, uh, assume that you have to be in the project to run those commands. These commands, uh, the, this particular command takes uh, the the txt file where we have listed the dependencies and it installs them so you do not do not have to manually write all the dependency names there so this has prompted me into a you know terminal ui uh, most probably when if you are running this into your pc or uh, laptop you won't be prompted because uh, i'm running it to a docker environment it does not have necessary information about my time zone so i'm just going to choose 6 asia and then 44 
Kolkata. This is the Kolkata time zone we we follow in India, and then it is so installed. Uh, you know uh, the uh, required dependencies. So as you can see. <clears throat> Uh, the dependency it is installed. It is saying that 3.8.2. So I was lucky that Python 20 already supports 3.8, but for some uh, you know uh, versions of Ubuntu they may not support 3.8. So what you may do, and uh, if you have problem we, when we have when we go to the interactive part of the workshop. Uh, I first want to just go smash through the steps. And when you have any issues, I answer them and I'll solve them. So generally what happens is that sometimes um, uh, the uh, the Python version is not what is required. So there are two options for it. So I just go to the documentation point to it that uh, if in case you use Ubuntu 20.04, where Python 3.8 is not uh, provided in the official repo, you can use PyEnv. To install Python 3.8, right? And it is not compatible with the Python 3.9 yet. So uh, it's not even compatible with Python 3.7. So you have to be on Python 3.8. It's very important. So I'm just going to show you how to see which Python version is installed. If I write Python dash dash version, sorry, Python dash dash, let me move it here version it says command not found python so a new uh, version of ubuntu uh, python is not installed by default so i have installed python 3 so i can just write python 3 instead so don't fret if there is any command in the documentation that uses python and uh, it says python uh, not found so you just uh, use python 3 because the uh, the server the server only supports python 3 anyway so it says python 3.8.5 Let's say it said Python 3.7 or Python 3.9, then it would mean that it's not compatible with your uh, with your installed uh, Python version. So we don't uninstall the current installed Python version because a lot of other projects might be dependent on it. So what PyEnv does is that it allows you to uh, install multiple Python versions simultaneously. So you can use PyEnv. Or if you want to globally install it, you can use, you can search uh, on DuckDuckGo that uh, how to install Python 3.8 on Ubuntu, whatever your version of uh, Ubuntu is. And then there will be some repositories that you can install and install a specific version of Python. And uh, I'll also tell you that how, for example, let's say you have Python 3.8.6 installed. So if you write Python 3 anywhere, then it will automatically take Python 3.8. Uh, six, but let's say you have now installed Python three point eight using app repositories or PyEnv or something else. Then how do you uh, force uh, the commands to use Python three point eight? One uh, you know trick is to use alias, uh, but then it'll use Python three point eight anywhere it references Python three, which might have conflict. Other uh, other way is to write Python three point eight directly. So if I had installed multiple versions of Python, I, I, I could have Python 3.6, Python 3.7. And by default, Python 3 would have uh, you know, defaulted to Python 3.6. Then if I wrote Python 3.8 everywhere, it would have automatically meant Python 3.8. Then uh, let's take a look at other installed dependencies, which is PostgreSQL. Now, it, it says that the server is installed, but you need to start server using this command, right? So you just copy it. You won't find this particular documentation in uh, the um, you know in the in the documentation because it changes from version to version. It changes from distro to distro. Um, I installed uh, it locally previously. It automatically is installed. Uh, it started the server. Uh, this time it didn't. So let's uh, paste this command. And it says that you know there's an error. You must run this program as cluster owner Postgres or root. So one thing that you can do is write sudo pg cluster. So you can run it as root and it will work. And I'm going to do that. So now it it has started the uh, PostgreSQL uh, server. How can I verify it? So psql is the command line, like Python is the command line for Python server. And the Python programming language, PSQL is the command line for PostgreSQL. So if I write PSQL, I say 
I see fatal role, Docker does not exist. So what happens is once you install PostgreSQL, the default user for the database is um, is uh, Postgres, right? And, and thus you cannot access this uh, PSQL command using uh, directly without passing in the user. So what you do is you write sudo dash u Postgres. So what it does is that it will switch your user to Postgres, which is installed by default once you install PostgreSQL, and then access the PSQL command. And once I do that, I can enter the uh, uh, Postgres SQL, uh, you know, uh, server uh, client uh, CLI. So uh, basically, uh, now it's working. So I just exit it and then resume the documentation. So next thing is how to uh, we have to install poetry. So we have uh, poetry is like pip. So you must have heard of pip if you have heard of Python, but pip has some uh, problems. For example pip does not have a good dependency resolution and locking mechanism which means that if i have installed a uh, request version 3.2 i might have uh, installed uh, request version 3.2.6 but when i am deploying the server to the you know production it may install some other version like 3.8.10 and that might contain breaking changes but i want uh, whatever I have tested to be the version that is deployed on production. And that's why Poetry has uh, locking of dependencies. And also, if you write, uh, if you change the order of dependencies in requirements.txt in pip, it also may, uh, you know, change the actual dependencies installed. So that's why we use Poetry. So uh, let's just copy this command, which is uh, given in the documentation and paste it. Now what happens, it says curl not found, Python not found. Python not found because uh, as you can see above, we have to write Python 3 or Python 3.8. So because a lot of uh, commands use Python for us, so I'm just going to use alias mechanism because I don't want various versions of Python. If I have, want to have that, I won't use alias, but now I, I don't want them. I, all, I want all Python commands to point to Python 3. Right, so if I just do that, it by default now, Python will alias to Python 3.8.5, right? So now the next thing is command not found curl. So we have to install curl now. So let's just say sudo apt install curl. As I said, if something is not found, you just do it like that. Now curl is installed. Let's rerun the command. And this will install poetry and uh, it's important what what comes next after that as you can see welcome to poetry and everything and it's saying that it will add the poetry command to this particular directory and one more thing which is important is that whenever a, pro a project is installed without the sudo command for example if you write sudo apt install something it will install in the global path right so you don't have to do anything but if you install something without uh, sudo uh, generally, it uh, installs it in your home directory, the user's directory, and it is not by default available in path. So if I write poetry right now, nothing will work. So a lot of people just uh, ignore what is written in the installation message. But if you read here, it is said that you need to add this directory where poetry is installed to your path. Now you can do it manually, but uh, next uh, it is said that it is already added it in your you know, uh, initialization script of the shell. But if you want to use it here and now, you can uh, use this command. So I'm going to do this. And uh, after, if I write poetry, it will work, right? So if I then the next command in the documentation is, uh, as you can see, source profile and everything. Uh, I already ran the source command. So I have to run the poetry install. So then let's run poetry install. So now uh, it says not compatible Python version. As I said previously, this is the most uh, you know notorious uh, issue that uh, we have uh, incompatible version of Python. Even when we install Python 3.8, poetry requires Python 3.8.6. Now, uh, this is something I recommend that you 
always use that's why i recommend that you use py py env so that you can have multiple versions of python but currently because we are in this uh, workshop uh, i'm just going to change the python project pyproject.tml where it is written that we have to use uh, python 3.8.6 so i don't have vim so again this is a nice uh, example that if you don't have something you just write sudo app install and that will be installed so i go here and change this to python 3.8.6 to python 3.8.5 now this will only work if you have python 3.8 if you have Python 3.6, Python 3.7, or Python 3.9, even if you change it, it in the poet, uh, this pyproject.2ml file, it won't work because we use Python features which are present in Python 3.8. So it will give syntax error on older Python versions. And Python 3.9 uh, has some breaking changes which our project does not support. So we, uh, we, have, we are locked in Python 3.8. So let's just run poetry install again. And then it will automatically create a virtual environment for us. So what is virtual environment? So if you use pip to install anything, it installs it globally, which might result in conflicting dependencies across projects. So a virtual environment is a special folder uh, where the dependencies is in installed and it is project specific. So it differs from project to project and it installs the dependencies uh, of a project in a in a specific folder and then if you uh, you want to use those dependencies you can't just use them uh, you know for, by default you uh, you will have to uh, enable that virtual environment okay so uh, but poetry makes it easy for us we don't have to manually create the virtual environment we do not have to uh, you know manually enable it and disable it and something like that it it is it is very easy uh, to manage virtual environments uh, using poetry. Uh, so um, uh, you, to confirm, uh, can everyone listen to me? Uh, is everyone following? Hello? Uh, yes, you uh, are audible, yeah. OK. Cool. So uh, the dependencies are now installed. The next thing we want to do, let's go back to the documentation. Next thing we want to activate is uh, projects virtual environment, right? So we write poetry shell. Poetry shell. <laughs> so once you have installed uh, the dependencies and whenever you want to work on the project, this is a, an important command. You don't have to run poetry install again and again, but whenever the dependencies of the project change, you need to do this. So for example, let's say you worked on project on November. Now you come back to the project in January, you uh, run git pull and you, uh, you know, uh, update your local project. Then uh, you run the project and you say module not found error. So a, a, a reasonable assumption is that the project has new dependencies that you don't have installed. So you have to poet, run Poetry install again. But uh, you don't have to run it again and again every time you want to contribute to a project. But you want to run Poetry Shell again and again. Because as I told you, it enables a virtual environment. If that virtual environment is not installed, uh, it's not activated, then those dependencies you installed previously will not be available to your project, right? So then uh, let's go again. Then says after installing the dependencies in your virtual environment, you need to configure pre-commit hook. So what is a pre-commit hook? Basically, pre-commit hook is uh, uh, is uh, uh, you know something which runs whenever you commit the code. Get when you whenever you run git commit. It runs. So we have configured some uh, hooks, like for example, uh, black, which is a Python formatter, and uh, import sorting codes and things like that. So you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to worry about formatting code and things like that. If you do not use this pre-commit, 
then your, uh, your PR may contain unformatted code and we might have to go through uh, cycles to say that please format your code, this and that. If you install pre-commits, then automatically whenever you commit it, it will format it by default. You don't have to do a lot of work. Then, then comes the juicy part, how to create database. So, <coughs> sorry. So uh, as uh, told previously that you have to use the sudo dash u command first of all, uh, to you know, uh, create a database and do anything related to Postgres, but this is very you know, um, you know, clunky. Why do you want to do that? So we can do we, we can make it easy by making ourselves super user, right? So uh, you can use this entire command, uh, uh, but the the thing is that you want to write your username. So as you can see. Uh, this in this environment, the user is Docker, right? You, it can be Ari, it can be Pratik, it can be something else. You then want to just uh, use your username here, and once you do that, you have to enter your password, and then th this user will be created in uh, Postgres. Now, if I run PSQL, it says database does, Docker does not exist, so I can say create DB, and then I can make it same as my username so what what's the benefit of it if you create a, a, a user in postgres sql with the same username as you your linux user your ubuntu user is and same a, a database as well with the same username as your linux user then you can write psql and by default the kind of the default arguments of this function of psql are the user and database is the same name as the uh, Linux username. Then you can access this uh, command line without sudo dash u postgres and something else. And, and now you're the super user, you can create any database uh, and anything at all. So then <coughs> you need to create uh, uh, the data, uh, the the database for the project, right? I'm skipping the dash o commands because they're kind of redundant uh, I, after this entire workshop i'll also be updating the documentation with whatever error you saw uh, being added into the documentation to make it easier for you so we'll add we'll run these two commands and now the these two databases have been created so to verify that i go to psql i say back backslash l and you can say see that we have docker database we have o event database you have over test database and others which are installed by default. I exit it. Then we go back to the documentation. And as you can see, um, uh, the documentation mentions that what kind of method is this. Uh, this method is called peer identification method, where connection is established via Unix domain socket. And thus, there's no need for password. So when I wrote PSQL, there was no need for me to enter a password for accessing that database, right? So this is a great way of authenticating for the local users. Then uh, they, they, there are some alternative ways of creating the uh, username and password and everything. Uh, then the next thing is about generating configuration. We run this command. There's dot env dot example file. If I say ls, you can see there's uh, well, let's this dash a here. So we have .env .example. So this is an environment file. So what is an environment file? Basically, environment file .env file lists some configuration variables, and uh, you can configure configure them using environment variables as well. But using .env file uh, makes it easy for you to see, see what are the configuration variables. So let me just first copy the command. Uh, this uh, dot uh, uh, dot env file, and then let's show you what's in the dot env file. So as you can see, the database URL points to Postgres SQL O event, the the the, uh, the database we just created, and then there's a commented uh, database URL as well, which lists another format of the URL. So if you did not follow the documentation, or <laughs> you have some uh, Postgres SQL in some other port or you have another database name, or you have another username, or you have another password, you can use this form of URL to connect, right? And then there's other environment variables about Postgres user and things like that. But 
next part is very important. So next part says that add the secret key uh, environment variable. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, basically, uh, it says that you have to add this environment variable to uh, for cryptographic users. So whenever we uh, generate passwords, you know, hash passwords and encrypt some files, we use the secret key. Uh, when we log in users, create tokens for them, we use this secret key. If you have a secret key, which is same for two instances of program, for example, let's say, I have eventy.com, and if I share your event my eventy.com secret key with you, then you can locally authenticate any user on eventy.com. So it will be a huge privacy breach. So that's that's a breach. So that's why we want this secret key to be unique to every project. That's why we have not included a default one in the .env project. And if we run project uh, without a secret key, it will show a warning as well. But Unfortunately, many people do not read this section, uh, but it's a very important step. So it is written that <coughs> you have to run this command uh, in order to generate a secret token. So let's uh, run this command. And let's copy this and add it as a secret key. So it is random. If you gen generate it multiple times, it's a different value again and again. I just go to dot env and add secret key here secret key equals this right now next thing now we have to uh, create db so basically we have to create the tables which are in the database so i just copy the command <coughs> and uh, now, this is giving me an error. What's the error? It says that lib Cairo was not found. So there's a dependency in, in a Python uh, environment which is not satisfied by the installed uh, you know, packages. So we want to install a new package. So how do we do this? As you already know, sudo apt install lib. Cairo. And it says there's no package named lib Cairo. Well, I said that whenever you need a project, you can just say sudo apt install in the project name. Why does it not work? So <coughs> there are two kinds of project. One is a project which is a binary, right? And then there's a project which is a source. So a binary project like Postgres, SQL, Redis, and Python, these are all which projects will depend on, but uh, they do it in a different way. And then there are source projects. So some uh, Python dependencies uh, depend on the source of this lib Cairo. So for that, you don't have to install lib Cairo. You have to install lib Cairo dev to actually install the dependencies and the source of this project. So I just say yes, and uh, it, it, it will be installing it. So there's the another tip that if you see a project not getting installed using sudo app install, try dash dev because it, it is a different thing, right? Now let's run this command again. <coughs> well, there's lib pango now. So let's first, let's try pango. There's nothing called pango. Then let's try lib pango. There's no lib pango. Okay, then let's let try lip pango dev. Well, there's no lip pango dev. Well, sometimes people just want to see the world burn and they make it hard to find things. So I found, I researched on the internet and this is lip 1.0 dev. So let's just do that and it will work. So sometimes the you know, the set of guidelines does not work. So you have to search it. And, uh, you know, if you, uh, this is, this should be in the documentation. So the documentation will be updated. But if you find yourself uh, in a situation like this, then uh, you're always free to visit the Gitter channel and ask, and we'll try to figure out what's happening. And, and this is what's the hard part of the project, right? It is not related to the project. Uh, inherently, but we have to maintain this documentation about the installation procedure as well. And um, that's why it's harder to maintain it even just for Ubuntu and it'll, 
it is much more harder to depend uh, maintain the documentation for Mac, which we don't use, and even harder for Windows because it's not even a Unix system. A lot of commands the same with Mac and Linux. But anyway, so now we have installed this. Now let's run the create db command. Oh, so yeah, it worked finally. So now it is asking email for super admin. So please uh, add your email. Do not add a dummy email because it's going to send you a confirmation email and a password reset email and something like that. So add your email, whatever uh, you own. This will be the, this will be the login for the admin, right? And then add a password. <laughs> so uh, you can add any password. I'm going to use. Uh, a dummy password here, and then it will uh, create all the tables required and everything and initialize. And then we do the next command to mark that the database migrations have been completed. So now this is done. The next thing now. Uh, it is written that if you uh, face any problem authentication with the database, then you have to change the name of the database and everything. I have already discussed it. Then we have to start the application. For macOS, we don't need to follow this. Run Celery, let's leave that. We want to install, uh, you know, run the server first. So let's run it. So yeah, the this was started. Now we want to access it, and uh, let's uh, access it uh, in the command itself. So So now I'll access the localhost 5000. And this gives me a plethora of things I, I, I don't know how to see. But anyway, it means that the server is um, ready. So one other, another very, for the hello world of our server API is basically uh, this command. So localhost 5000 v1 uh, settings. So it, it gives you a setting uh, for this uh, project. So basically now it's working, and uh, th there can be other things as well. I wanted to show you the actual uh, uh, app interface. Uh, now, if I go to localhost 5000, And there's nothing here. The reason for that is that I'm running this in, in Docker. And uh, basically, this is running it on localhost. So it's running locally in Docker. So I want it to be uh, running on 0 0.0.0.0. 0 .0. And uh, now, if I go and load localhost 5000, you'll see Open Event API Server. So let me just uh, increase the font size here as well. And there you have it, the, the server instance. And there's this login. Oh, my. It's too enlarged. <coughs> so there's this uh, login inf information and other documentation. You can access this. It's a very big page. It's very detailed. But basically, here it is. And similarly, you can go to v1 slash settings, and it will show you the you know the default settings and everything. And there's also this thing that we have integrated a very small uh, part of API into GraphQL, so you can do that as well. So as you can see, there's documentation query uh, and there's settings and everything. So if I write query settings app name, so you can see this, uh, you know, auto completion and everything. So this is a very cool part as well. <laughs> well, the only thing you can query right now are settings, but anyway, this works app name 
and uh, a pay, PayPal client and everything. This is autocomplete. So this is very cool as well. So this is how we install the server. So uh, we are going to take a little break and answer questions and then also move to front end. So uh, let's, let's then uh, answer. Uh, if you have any questions, then you can ask right now about the, this entire process. Where if you are stuck uh, anywhere, you need any help, what's, what's the status? So um, yeah. So I, I, as I can see that uh, there are a lot of things going up in chat. So um, yeah, th that's good. Arif, do you want me to read questions for you or what, how should we move forward? Yeah, so uh, if you can uh, tell me that, uh, you know, uh, a gist of questions, then I can answer them one by one. OK, uh, so I guess we'll start with the most recent one. The The question is, so this is totally about API endpoints. The real app we see and develop features are for open event front end, question mark. Yeah, great yeah. question. So yeah, this is uh, basically uh, the real app is still the server. The entire logic of how to create events, how to validate, and everything is still in the server but yes the ui you see on eventry.com it's front end so the separation is between the server and front end the server interacts with the database for fetching and uh, querying and uh, uh, you know val validation and uh, sending emails and everything logic handling and the front end is uh, whatever you see in the ui yeah does that uh, answer your question uh, shashi khan yeah, OK. Uh, next question, please. Eric was having uh, some difficulty. Eric, uh, can you uh, please open your mic and, and tell me that it's solved? Uh, first, let's answer Gerald's question. Right. How does the API server interact with JC? That's a good good question. Uh, we uh, you know, integrated, integrated JC. Uh, before any other video solution because it does not require uh, api server to uh, interact with it it uh, it can just uh, you know you can just put an iframe in in the uh, page with a unique url and that's it you're golden you don't need to create some uh, you know uh, you don't need to create some tokens you do not need to create some uh, hit some api urls and you just need to uh, access uh, Jitsi via iframe, so it's very easy. So it does not need uh, integration with Jitsi. But yes, we do store information regarding to the passcodes of the uh, sessions, uh, video sessions uh, in regards to Jitsi, uh, you know, rooms. For example, if I set password of a room, then whenever a person loads the, you know, a Jitsi room on event A, automatically that password is set. And if someone else has the URL of that GC and does not know the password, then they will not be able to uh, guess the password. So that's the only part uh, which we handle in GC. Yeah. Yes, and uh, other questions uh, at the beginning also. So, uh, some of them were answered by Pratik too, nicely. Yeah, 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 and also uh, Mayu uh, is uh, saying that uh, I just mentioned the advantages of integration with Jitsi. What are the potential disadvantages? The disadvantages yeah. are that, uh, for example, a, a Jitsi room, as I said, it's not protected. So there's no distinction between a speaker and an attendee. Everyone is a speaker. Everyone can uh, do anything. We do not have a control on Jitsi. Uh, you know, as uh, as uh, compared to other solutions, so that's a disadvantage, and um, we we cannot customize customize it a lot, and there's uh, you know, uh, this is uh, generally what 
uh, we see as disadvantages. You see, the we can uh, well if you compare it to Big Blue Button, then we cannot even uh, you know synchronize uh, you know presentations and uh, a lot of other things. Uh, so Jitsi is just a peer to peer communication thing. There's no hierarchy in terms of uh, rights, moderator rights, and everything else. Yeah. Like in a fun way, we can say like Jitsi is the big brother of Big Blue Button. <laughs> yeah, or or the other way around as well. Uh, but yeah, you, you can say that um, Jitsi is much more, you know. Uh, homogeneous, uh, but Big Blue Button has a concept of administrators and moderators and normal attendees. Yes, uh, yes. Jitsi does not have any admin option, like Jitsi controls the admin options, we don't, and then there are no moderators as well. Yeah, like to control the flow, flow of the viewers, uh, Big Blue Button is a good choice, whereas for mass participation, Jitsi is a good choice. Yeah. Any more questions? Our uh, Arib and Pradeek will be more than happy to answer these. Yeah, and also like we have integrated Rocket Chat as well. So <clears throat> a disadvantage is uh, a disadvantage which uh, extends to Jitsi and Big Blue Button both is that once the meeting ends, once the last person in the group is gone, the public chat. Uh, erases it's not stored because that room is available for other people to join as well you do, can't own uh, you know a group in jitsi this is a disadvantage in big blue button we can own uh, a group but still uh, the public chat is erased and everything so that's why we have now integrated rocket chat so if you want to have some conversation and uh, you know you want it to persist across sessions then uh, we recommend that you use the chat feature on uh, you know the left side panel and then uh, it won't be uh, you know it won't be erased it will persist across the uh, entire session and after that as well and uh, about how far can we go with the integration well it's still rocket chat so there there's a distinction between a rocket chat user and an event user we automatically create a rocket chat user whenever you access chat but yes there are limitations because there's no link so if you change your name on event it won't change on rocket chat and uh, there's username difference on uh, rocket chat as well your profile picture will not be linked uh, and uh, well we will obviously increase the features and uh, linkage of rocket chat and event uh, but still it's a uh, third party uh, you know integration we own it it's it's our instance but still there's only so much you can do with it then uh, uh Hiri would be great to have a follow-up session to look at the integration architecture yeah sure but well, i'll be in the discussion uh, 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 section as well so we can have a follow-up session with that okay then how do I record session recording? That is specific to Big Blue Button and uh, others. Like Jitsi uh, has a recording feature, but I've not gone into it uh, myself. So it's more uh, of a question about uh, other video solutions than even TA. So I, I I don't know the answer for, for that, honestly. Uh, can we integrate Rocket Chat more closely? Could this be a GSOC project or an internship project? Yes. <clears throat> the goal for uh, Rocket Chat is to have per event rooms and also uh, you know uh, this will mean we have to uh, dynamically create the rooms and everything and uh, it is difficult to synchronize both users but it is possible it's not impossible it's not technically impossible so yeah it will be a good project for integration as well because we anyway need to add a chat platform and to reinvent everything rocket chat has already done i think is not um, you know it is it will be a waste of effort the the great thing about open source projects is that there's no uh, you know thing that we, we need to only create our own solutions and everything so we have open source great open source projects we do not need to reinvent the wheel and if we can uh, uh, you know uh, create all the features we want with the integration with rocket chat uh, it will be a great project and uh, it will fit really well with the event here <coughs> 
then uh, is there an option to support gitter.im the idea being that users team could uh, 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 could orient to their code repositories good question this was our goal but unfortunately this is 2020 2021 and um, a lot of projects are moving away from iframe so what have we done is that whenever we integrate third party solutions into a website we use iframe there are portals coming but iframes are the current solution but iframes have problems as well there's click jacking and everything the the download buttons you see everywhere the like button facebook like button there they can be a lot of click jacking on uh, you know uh, iframes so that's why people are moving from iframes and they uh, limit the option to load their site on other sites iframe so for example matrix uh, forbids it and Gitter also does not allow you to load it into an iframe in another website. That's why we went to Rocket Chat. The first um, you know, choice was for Gitter. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, so uh, uh, we will have more questions in the um, in the uh, discussion as well, and we can have uh, more questions after the front end integration. Let's answer the last one right here. That what other integrations are possibly on the roadmap? Then <laughs> uh, currently uh, we have not integrated Zoom very well on the platform. There are other video platforms as well. Uh, even big blue button, we can have much more control over it. Uh, we can show video recordings and everything. And uh, uh, even with chat, it may be so that uh, some other project we find to be, uh, uh, you know, much more better fit than Rocket Chat. Uh, <clears throat> even uh, we want to develop our own solution for video conferencing so that we have more control and we, we maybe we can make it much more scalable uh, fingers crossed and uh, maybe it will be used by other people who may just be interested in uh, video integration and not only on event here so uh, the goal is to just not benefit our own platform but also benefit others so um, if people will be interested in it we uh, uh, we we are also thinking about creating a, our own video platform details are not finalized but yeah yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Arib. I am sorry. I want to butt in here a moment because I see like we have a, a good interest here and in a good group um, of uh, participants. Um, and we're definitely interested to collaborate with other projects. Um, and we're interested to get uh, students or, or also hire people um, for projects. Um, so um, if you want to continue in this uh, direction, it would be really great. And I specifically um, wanted uh, um, to ask the last question um, um, to uh, maybe show a bit like in, in what direction we could head. I mean, we could think about a lot of things, 2D worlds, 3D worlds, um, integration with more video platforms. And um, yeah, uh, the you know, the limit is the horizon, right? The limit is the sky. Um, so um, yeah, if you uh, um, like this project, please continue and there will be more workshops. And uh, back to you, Arib. Yeah, thank you. So uh, then uh, if you have any more questions, then uh, we will answer them after the front end integration section. And uh, then let's uh, start with the front end part. Let me share my screen again. So now I'm in the front end repository. And this is where most people want to start. I wanted to, you know, uh, get the server out of the way but it is a bit more uh, involved to uh, you know install and that's why people get deterred so <clears throat> that's why i just wanted to show you that yeah there are hurdles but generally you will find solutions for them uh, the tips i gave are very general so it, they can be applied to the projects as well but front end is the 80 20 section of our project so 80 percent of the things get done in the front end even though it's only 20 percent of the entire application it's uh, very easy to install, but uh, and also a lot of project uh, or, or a lot of people want to be involved on front end much more than server. So let's get started on that. We go to the local installation page. 
and then these are the dependencies. <coughs> Sorry. So first we need get. We already have that, right? Then the next thing is Node.js 14.x LTS. So uh, you know uh, uh, this is something again which I iterated in the Python part that this is something which people do not care a lot about. And so a lot of people come and sometimes they even install uh, Node.js uh, 13. Uh, sometimes they even install Node.js 15. We want to install Node.js 14, right? And uh, that's why we also want to may want to use NVM. Uh, you know, which is Node Version Manager. It's like PyENV, and uh, it allows you to install multiple versions of Node. So I currently don't even know what is the default version of Node.js on this. So I'll just get started, and maybe we'll have to, you know, pivot and uh, digress. So <clears throat> I'll go back to the repository. I'll run deactivate. Deactivate is a command if you de want to deactivate the virtual environment you are in. So as you can see, node is not installed currently. So I say sudo apt install node. I put, put in my password. There is nothing called node. If you search, uh, you know, uh, the, the, you don't want to install node dash dev uh, because it's a binary. So if you search, you will find that it, it should be node.js instead. So I just say yes. <coughs> So uh, now you see uh, this Node.js is installed. I say node dash dash version. It's 10.19.0. Unfortunately, that won't work. So let's see what we need to do to install Node 14. Install Node 14. There are multiple, uh, you know, uh, installation guidelines. If I go to this Node.js official site, it, it, has, an, uh, it has an option to <coughs> download Node.js 14. Uh, this is a, you know, kind of a visual installer and uh, a package and things like that. I'm running in Docker and I like to, you know, work on command line so that uh, there are reproducible steps so I can tell other people to do so. So I'll not use this. The next thing is installing Node.js with NVM. So we'll follow this. So first of all, uh, let me just <coughs> increase the font size. Yeah. So first, we want to install NVM. Set. <clears throat> so now it's uh, installing the NVM. And again, uh, if this did not require sudo. That's why an, an, another general trip that, which we discussed last time, it did not involve sudo. So thus, it's, it, it installs in the user, uh, user directory. And thus, we cannot access NVM right now. If I write NVM, it won't work. So we have to run this command. So. <clears throat> Um, you can add it to your profile like bash, uh, dot profile bash rc. It automatically does it, but we need to, you know, close the terminal and do it again, load it again. But if I just copy and paste this, this will work now. So if I run NVM, great. So it will work. <coughs> so um, now I can use NVM install 14.15.0. Use the latest version of 14, not greater than that. So I just remember that this is what works with the project. So I'll just do this. <coughs> and uh, I've just seen the command from the example just above. So it's not like you have to go somewhere else. So uh, you do not have to read the entire article. I just opened the article, saw that, oh, I have just you have to use this link. And then uh, things may fall in place by default. So now default alias is 14.15.0. Uh, if I say node dash dash version, <coughs> it is 14.15.0. Sometimes it may happen so <coughs> that uh, you have already installed NVM and you have already installed another node. 
and now you want to install node 14 because it's different from your default node so what you uh, must do is then use this command which is in nvm alias default and then whatever version of node you want to be the default node, right <coughs> so that is how you uh, install node and similarly if you install node npm is already installed but there's one more dependency here which is yarn okay <coughs> So uh, this yarn repo uh, needs to be installed. And we have linked the documentation. So if I just go there, so I can install it using this command. So let me just copy this, and I'll paste it here. <coughs> now if I run yarn, I can see that, yes, it worked. It it does, did nothing right now. So uh, then let's go to this part again. You want to clone your repository, uh, but uh, I won't. Uh, I have already done it, and I'm just showing it. So I'm. I won't just. I won't clone it. Sorry, I, I won't fork it. But you want to fork the repository if you, uh, you don't want to contribute. So let's just clone it. And also, while it's uh, cloning, I want to show that we have this video linked here, installation video, that if you go to, you'll see similar steps. It assumes that you have already installed Yarn and everything, but uh, it has all the steps that you need to do to install the, the project, yeah, right? So you can uh, look at this as well. <clears throat> okay, so back here. Now we want to go to the project open event front end, right? <clears throat> so now let's see what the documentation says next. It says I have to run. I have run. I have to run yarn after running CD, right? So let's run it. It will uh, install the packages. So the package installation may uh, take some time. So uh, does it even have any other intermediate question or were they trying something and it didn't work uh, or something I kind of missed in the chat that they, they want to discuss? OK, anyway, the, <laughs> the dependencies have been installed. So then let's continue. Uh, <clears throat> the next command is this. Um, ironically, uh, this is very clearly mentioned here, but either one of these commands is missed by most of the people who are beginning with the project. So anyway, this is something which we did in the server as well. So again, we copy the .env command. Let's see what's in the .env command. So this is uh, kind of, again, the configuration you have. It has API host. 
it has <clears throat> fast boot disabled and this and that uh, we'll come to what api host means this is the most important you know configuration kind of the only one uh, which we need to discuss right now then next uh, we copy this and run so <clears throat> the front end project uh, whenever you run it on uh, windows will probably break it this part right as you can see that hey um, get text is not found so basically um, now it's saying that do you want to ins automatically install it i'll say yeah <clears throat> so they'll install it but uh, basically um, uh, again so okay so windows did not does not have get text i just install it uh, using the default timeline sorry default uh, Want. Okay. Sudo app install get text. This is something which is not installed on Windows and Linux as well, but in Linux it's very easy. In uh, Windows it's not that easy. Right. So uh, if you want to use it on Windows, the easiest thing is to just install WSL. But anyway, if you want to use it on Windows, Windows, then uh, install get text uh, there are multiple ways none of them are very easy like linux so anyway you run this command and you see this message <coughs> so now it's done uh, it will show some warnings uh, again not very important now then uh, this this is uh, the uh, notes about get text and everything now how to run the project so you run yarn start <laughs> now it will build the project and um, you know it it is a little bit heavy and so uh, it does take time and resources i have 16 gb in uh, ram in my laptop and uh, 8 gb swap currently they are completely filled so uh, it is an involved process so does anyone have any question uh, till this part and you are seeing this, these kind of deprecation and warnings and everything unfortunately these are not present in our code these are present in the dependencies we are using so we cannot do much about it unfortunately <clears throat> i can hear the fans pumping up <laughs> Okay, so now it's running on localhost 4200. So again, if I go here, I write curl localhost 4200. Uh, it returns me something which means it worked. <coughs> now I go here, localhost 4200, nothing shows up. Again, the reason being that I have to bind it to, uh, I'm running it in uh, Docker and not actually on my machine. So I have to bind it to 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0 and also uh, <coughs> on port 5000 because I've only exposed 5000 to my machine. So let's say I don't exactly even know that if this command will work, but <coughs> fingers crossed. so uh, that didn't work so then let me search how to 
do this. So this is something which you might also experience that you do not know something and how to do something. So how to change embedded support? <laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, what we can do instead, already I've shown you how to install. So instead of doing it in Docker, we can do it in um, our own actual uh, host machine. So <clears throat> I'll go to get open event front end and uh, let me change the dot env to correct site, right? So I'll be talking about API host just in a bit once I show you what it is so yarn start So now I go to localhost 4200. And here it is. So whatever you see in eventia.com, you'll get access to as well. Um, <clears throat> I'm currently logged in. Uh, you have to log in it into the same, uh, using the same credentials as you used in the uh, you know, in the uh, eventy.com. So uh, this is how you start the front end project. So now let's let me talk about uh, the dot env. Uh, so if I go to pim <coughs> dot env, you can see I have written three API hosts here. So what is an API? Host? So the way we connect. Uh, front end to back end is using this API host uh, environment variable. So by default, it is uh, this thing. So let me disable this and enable this. So by default, it is this. This is our development server. And <clears throat> it obviously does not contain the same events which are on eventy.com, which is a production server, right? So uh, a lot of times people, when they install the front end project, they say, well, I cannot find for Summit 2021 here. I cannot find my event here because it's a different server. That's why you cannot find it. So by default, we encourage you to use the development server for creating events and everything so that they do not show up on the production side. Uh, so whenever you use this by default, when you, whenever you run uh, Yarn Start by default, you won't uh, see those events that you see on eventy.com. Right, but sometimes you do want to use eventy.com for some reason because it might be an existing bug on a, an event. So it might be, you know, a very specific bug that only happens on one event. So then you will just change API host to api.eventy.com, and <clears throat> you'll have to recompile it uh, again. And uh, if you go to then uh, localhost forty two hundred, then it will work. But let's say you want to um, use the local server you install, then how do you do it? Because sometimes you want to uh, access the admin section and everything. You cannot do it using api.eventy.com. You cannot do 
it using API, uh, so, uh, the dev server API. So you have to use the local server. So as I showed you previously, if you run your uh, local server on localhost 5000, then you just have to do this. You have to run API host equal to localhost 5000. And then you just go to the project and then you use the same credentials that you used at the time of installation of the server, the super admin email and password, and then you log in and you will be logged in as admin. And so you'll be able to see the admin section, right? So generally this is how uh, you link your front end to the uh, back end. So obviously when you do this, uh, you won't see any events because there are no events on local server when you start uh, and uh, you have to create your own events and things like that. So this was generally how you uh, install front end and back end and how you link them. What is the API host? There are the configuration variables, uh, kind of leave them to their exercise for the user. Uh, this is generally what you need to do uh, to create, uh, install all the dependencies, the database and everything for Server install server run server and then install front end and link front end to the server. So this uh, is the kind of end of the demonstration. If otherwise, if you want to see anything in action, do you have any requests as to what uh, should I do? Uh, then I'll take those. So yeah, uh, any questions then uh, about whatever you saw right now? Did uh, when if, if you you know tried something out and what 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 do you have in mind? What what do you need? Do you uh, need clarification on something? Yeah. Okay, Arif uh, San asked in the chat uh, if uh, like it is recommended in the documentation of front end that uh, uh, you should also use watchman but i'm not sure if that part is still relevant or not so can you answer that yeah, yeah. that should be uh, removed from the documentation uh, watchman uh, the project itself automatically has uh, you know file watchers so installing watchman does not really um, help a lot Any other question, requests, like even general requests about the project, about how to get started and everything, about terminologies in the project, uh, how to reach to a section uh, regarding architecture, permissions. I'm like, it's a general uh, Q and A, fireside chat kind of thing. So you can ask anything. So how many of you uh, like uh, at least started uh, to get an idea how to do stuff and uh, were, were, was anyone of you trying um, in the project and how to do stuff? So uh, I see a question here, is the project shifting to React? So um, we, we will be having discussions over what to do um, and uh, we have not finalized the uh, tech stack or something else and uh, uh, it will be a gradual process so um, uh, you should uh, you know get involved with the discussion on uh, get involved with the project on Gita and we'll announce that we are having a discussion we'll have kind of uh, discussions and debates about what what should be done how it should be done and whatever we do should be sustainable in a way that it does not hold the project current project uh, such that it is not being used and it's not being 
fixed developed uh, for a long period of time and uh, also it should mean that we are not working on two um, projects targeting a same specific component page or anything so it's not yet final what needs to be done but yes uh, we, are, we are moving from uh, to a, a newer and better technology So no worries, uh, Shashikant. You can try the documentation specifically on front end. It's not that uh, you know involved. It's not that difficult. And if you get stuck, you can ask on uh, Git as well. Okay, so uh, anything else? Uh, anyone has tried to like uh, do the steps? Uh, try to set up open and server and front end. Uh, okay, San has asked uh, that uh, can you tell how to choose uh, issues, signal related? So mostly issues are marked with a tag. If you want, if you can go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. OK. So uh, yeah, uh, most of the times issues are marked uh, with the tag uh, with, say, good first issues. So you can directly go to those. And you can simply search here. Uh, maybe I'll share my screen. OK, here it is. So can everyone see my screen? Yes. OK. So you can simply go to labels. And here you will find the label uh, good first shoe. So you can simply click on that. Uh, OK, for now, uh, I think it's not marked. And most of them are closed. So uh, we'll mark some of the issues at good good first issues, one of which we just found that in README uh, Watchmen part is no longer required. So maybe someone can work on that. Uh, and same with the server. And also, I like to say that uh, currently we're not, uh, we don't, uh, you know, have that kind of uh, discussion over that is this issue simple, is this, is this issue difficult? Sometimes even high priority issues are uh, marked, uh, you know, uh, which are just, we, they just require one change in class. And so uh, once you start, um, you know, seeing closed issues, recent closed issues and the PRs, you'll try to uh, get an idea, get, a, get an idea that what kind of uh, issues are easy, what kind of issues are difficult. So uh, I, I recommend that you just start with the project first, use it and then um, you know try to uh, understand the issue uh, try to understand what the issue is talking about try to reproduce it and once you see the uh, you know uh, uh, merged prs how to how the existing contributors have solved you we will get uh, start to get an idea about it uh, then any other question otherwise then we will move on to showing uh, the uh, the structure of the front end project because sometimes people get lost about it so uh, does anyone else have any other question before we move on to the front end uh, structure okay then uh, let's move on to the front end structure a lot of people have problems understanding some of the terminologies i already touched some part of it so um, for example the organizer admin and everything else but uh, generally uh, they still have problems and uh, understanding what uh, the uh, issue creator means about some of the things so let me um, collapse all the areas so basically 
this is the project, right? And uh, this app folder, which is what we generally focus on, there are the things which um, which are also important, but major or majority of the code is in the app folder, right? And let me also increase it a bit. Okay. <clears throat> So now we have these all components. Generally, uh, a mistake in terms of learning something new is that we want to learn everything. And uh, sometimes we begin linearly and we do it in uh, a breadth first kind of way. Like I want to learn every bit of something and then I want to get deep into it. It's good in terms of for example, if you're learning web development or Android or something else, it's not good for a project because projects are huge. Imagine someone going to uh, you know Google and saying that I want to learn about your search engine and uh, just wanting to learn first uh, about every component and then focus about one component. It will take years for him to even get to know all the components. So <clears throat> you don't want to focus on uh, all the components at, at first. You want to focus on individual components. When you read an issue, then you realize that it's in on public page. You want to realize where is the public page. So first starting point in the project, uh, it's not obvious, it's router.js. So I'll go to router.js and uh, let me collapse this. So this is the file and it, it uh, shows you that what is the URL structure of the site. It lists all the possible URLs in the site. And thus, it is the best starting point in the site. <clears throat> this will show you the structure that there's a login page, register page, this is password, this and that. Then this public. Now, what is meaning by public? So if something is written as logout, it literally means that the page, if you visit slash logout, this page, you know, will handle this uh, route. But if you have written path, it this overrides this. So it's no longer public, but slash e slash dynamic event ID. So right now, if you look in your URL, uh, it will be event.com slash e slash some event ID. So this route handles it. <coughs> and then there are nested parts in it. For example, slash sessions, slash schedule. And then there are. Uh, slash schedule slash user slash user ID, which means uh, favorite of a particular user. Then there's session ID details. Then there are streams. Currently, uh, you are on the stream route. So for example, this is a, a good example where a person might be confused. For example, we may say that there's a bug in a video room and you look at the URL and it's uh, slash e slash event id slash video slash video name slash stream id and he, uh, the person might think that um, it, it, there's a video route and when they search for it they'll find mm, nothing there so uh, but it corresponds to stream route so stream is the route so if i want to go to this route i'll have to search stream and then view so I can now go to this route, right? So this is how you navigate to the project. You don't look at URL exactly. <coughs> you uh, look at the do, uh, dot route. And similarly, if you want to see chat, you see, okay, stream, view, chat. And there it is. So this is an example and let's uh, move from here. Let's say you see a, uh, an issue which says that there's an issue in the chat, um, you know, uh, view chat URL. So first you go to the route, the JS or TS file. There it will be uh, about how, how uh, the uh, data on this page should be loaded, and this is done using the model function. I'll not go into details about the implementation detail, but I'm just telling that how data gets loaded. So in the model function, we load all the data needed for the project. And how it is rendered? <coughs> Video, view, chat. Sorry. 
video stream chat. <coughs> what was it? Stream view chat, I think. Yeah. Stream view chat. And then there's this public stream view. And this is the template, right? So here we write the logic of how the UI should be shown. And this is a good way of reaching to where the component is. A lot of times I see uh, that how I edit something on this page. So first you go to router.js, you find a particular route, you go to the JavaScript file to understand what data is being loaded. You, then you go to the template file to see that how the data is being laid out, what's the layout of the data. And there you will see things like this, this is a component. So how do you reach to this component? So there's this components folder. So this was about route, right? And, and, and the route, things are present in templates. So templates folder contain the UI of both the routes and the components. But routes and components differ. So a route uh, uh, lays out only the you know, top level URL. But if you want to reuse some part of it uh, in several pages, you need components. So in components, and I can see public stream chat, so I'll go to public stream and then chat so there's this chat.ts it has you know this uh, logic and if i want to see the template i will go public stream chat so public stream chat so i can see that the app templates component stream public stream so here i can see this component and I have reached here that how do I need to show rocket chat? So this is the hierarchy of how you uh, reach to a particular point. Then <clears throat> there are helpers, then there are services. These are all embeds specific, uh, but I just wanted to show you how do you do this. Is, this is not specific to Ember, the, the hierarchy, because this is the same with React.js, this is the same with Vue.js, this is the same with anything. All of them have a kind of a router.js file. If you're using Nuxt or Next, then it is file-based routing, but still it's a hierarchy of routes. So you first need to focus on how, on which URL you are. Then you need to map the URL to the actual route using router.js. Then you go to this <laughs> route.js file for individual route or its template. And then you see what components are used in these templates. And then you um, you can reach at that component. So this is how you do it. The second way to do it is uh, using uh, this uh, <coughs> Ember Inspector. So for example, if you install Ember Inspector dev tools from the Chrome App Store, also Firefox, Mozilla, Mozilla Firefox store, then you will have this Ember tab in your dev tools. And then you can right click on a particular component and click on inspect Ember component. And it, it should work, but I don't know why it's not working. Yeah, it worked. So basically it, it is showing me that this, you can see index route, right? And then you can see that this is event card. And then you can see the, the, the prop which is passed on it, the action on it, and things like that. So this is how uh, you debug to a very uh, you know, um, granular level. You, want, you, need to, you don't want to find globally, but you want to reach from router to controller and, and things like that. There are multiple instructions. These are MBJ specific, so I want to keep it abstract. The next way to find something is I inspect it <coughs> and I see, oh, there's this header, smart overflow, ember view, things like that class. I search it. I can also search the ID equal to this and that. You know, what happens if I do that? I search it and there's nothing like that. And if I added ID and something like that, even it will be more difficult to find um, find a view like that. So I realized that it's too specific. So I try to be smart about it and realize that, okay, maybe Ember view is automatically added by Ember. And I search for it and 
is still isn't there so i remove it want something even more and now i can find oh there's this smart overflow component or and and thus it might have been used in this and similarly you 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 will have to do some hit and tries like like you can search for this uh, and there's nothing like that you you remove ui card even fluid you you do this so it's it's hard but sometimes you find it so that's why i recommend the first method uh, the router and then the template and then the component or you can use ember inspector that's good as well ember inspector will tell you the component so you still have to find the component uh, in the code yourself but uh, this is a kind of thing um, which you need to do in order to understand the project so as i said you don't need to understand every part of the project i just showed you a specific part about chat right you did not know anything you just uh, saw that how to reach to a specific chat component without without knowing anything about authentication authorization event card and uh, a lot of other things you don't need to so basically this is uh, generally how you do uh, debugging on front end so um, now uh, that, that's it from my side about the debugging part do you, now do we have any questions I see, I see someone's hands raised. Do they want to ask any question? So did we have any question in the chat? Let's see. Most of the questions are well answered by Pratik. I have to say that. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Pratik. And yeah, thank yeah. you, Pratik. He's taking good care of our chat. Yeah. So then uh, if we don't have any questions, then uh, finally, I'd say uh, I'll talk about the users. So what the, there are different kind of users in, in the system. I've already touched on that. One is administrator, super administrator, administrator. And they, have, they can see anything. They can see the sales of all events. And uh, they can edit event details. And they can uh, see the users. Then there are organizers who can who have control of events, but they cannot see, uh, you know, um, the users and everything else. They can see the users of their events, attendees. They can add tickets. They can see the details of their events, but not other events. And then the last year, there, there are also granular additions and organizer like organizer, co-organizer, owner, and owner can is the person who can only um, like only he can delete the event. Uh, and um, uh, organizers and co-organizers can edit everything but not delete the event neither they can transfer the event to another user and then but these are all group of users who control the event then even in video streams we have modifiers oh, sorry moderators and uh, lastly the uh, we have attendees so if you have bought a ticket you can access uh, a particular uh you know video room if you have not bought the ticket then you are not even an attendee and thus you are even in the lower tier of user hierarchy and you cannot access an events uh video room and then last uh even lower is unverified user so if you sign up using a, e a an email that you don't own then uh, you are unverified and you may not be able to buy free tickets and uh, there are some other restrictions on the profile as well so these are the user hierarchies we have currently so uh, i hope this uh, clears air about a lot of things uh, of the project and uh, uh, again do we have any other do we have any question that people want to answer or be answered okay so uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, if you have any question, uh, we I'll be in the discussions room. 
and i hope this uh, session uh, helped you uh, realize uh, how to start uh, with eventa we will have uh, another session uh, like this tomorrow and uh, please let others know if they want to get started with open event and uh, want to contribute that uh, there will be a session tomorrow and if you have any other question uh, today you'll try something and uh, if you have any question then you can ask them tomorrow as well so yeah thank you everyone yes it it was an excellent session delivered by arib and uh, as a backbone pratik too and this is not it we also have two more workshops for the same thing and you can see further information about the workshops workshops in the schedule and you can also surely join us there and we hope that you have enjoyed our day one of the fossil chess summit and i am sure we'll see you tomorrow with more fun more knowledge and we'll learn together grow together so uh, with this i want to end the stream and see you tomorrow folks uh, you want to say something pratik ari no uh, you you uh, you made a great conclusion to the uh, you know first day of first asia summit so uh, yeah thank you everyone and uh, then let's meet tomorrow Yes, let's meet tomorrow.